to Real Democracy Now. I'm Nevek Thompson and Real Democracy Now is a podcast for people who think we can and should improve how democracy works. This podcast looks at democracy from different angles to help you think about how democracy might be improved. Welcome to Episode 8 in Season 3 of Real Democracy Now! a podcast. Hi, I'm Therese Arsenault. I'm a political scientist at the University of Canterbury, where I'm a senior fellow. I have worked for the Electoral Commission in New Zealand on the 2011 referendum on the electoral system and the review of MMP. Season 3 is looking at electoral systems around the world, and in this episode, we're looking specifically at the radical changes that have occurred relatively recently in New Zealand and their wide-ranging impact. This interview was recorded not long after the last election, and definitely before the world got to know the current New Zealand Prime Minister, Jacinda Ardern. Thanks so much, Therese, for joining me. And I think New Zealand is one of the few countries in the world to have effectively implemented significant electoral reform. Can you give us the background to the changes that occurred in the early 90s to New Zealand's electoral system? It's a wonderful story. It's quite extraordinary, really. As you say, it's, it is exceptional for a, par, for a country to change its voting system. And I think especially for a stable country like New Zealand, Alan Rennick, talks about it as being the most momentous post-war electoral reform. And, you know, somewhat surprising because he characterized New Zealand as being somewhat cautious and conservative in terms of its change around the voting system. He, you know, he, he says a country that had previously shown exceptional conservatism stepped decisively into the unknown. I actually think the roots of this go back much further than the 1990s. And in fact, I think New Zealand is a mix of indeed being cautious, but also we have some examples way back of being really bold in terms of our voting system. So for example, the Māori seats were established in 1867. We established a representation commission as well, not long after that. And that that's um, a quasi-judicial body. And it was formed to try to take the politics, I guess, out of redesigning electoral boundaries. So that was way ahead of its time. And New Zealand also, of course, was the first country to give to extend the franchise to women. And that was in 1893. So that, again, you know, goes way back. So arguably, New Zealand was the first country with full franchise in the world. So New Zealanders are willing to be bold. But the truth is, we, we had been very much attached to our first past the post system for quite some time. So what happened? Well, it really was an improbable and I think unique set of circumstances that led to it. I sort of, when I talk to my students about it, I, I say it's basically akin to all the planets being in a line. And it really starts the, the direct causes of the change in the voting system. I think you probably need to go back to the abolition of New Zealand's upper house, the Legislative Council, back in 1950. And the point was that the Legislative Council wasn't incredibly effective, but what it was was the only possible check on the lower house of parliament. And that's because the backdrop of our constitutional arrangements we don't, we're not a federal system, so we're unitary. We don't have a written entrenched constitution. Um, and once the legislative council was gone, the reality was we have one house of parliament. It was elected by first past the post and it was very much two party dominated. So one party always had a very strong majority and an ability to actually to get things done very quickly. And in fact, um, we were known as an elective dictatorship, the fastest lawmakers in the West. And former Prime Minister Sir Geoffrey Palmer actually published a book calling us unbridled power. So an ability to actually stop a government between elections was quite difficult in New Zealand. Now, as I said, the Legislative Council wasn't incredibly effective, and that's why it, it was dissolved. But it was dissolved with the expectation that something else more effective would be brought 
into New Zealand to provide an effective check on the government between elections. And there was a lot of discussion over many years what that new thing should be. Uh, For some people, they thought it should be an entrenched constitution. For other people, a return to an upper house, but an elected upper house this time. But then eventually, other people started saying, well, actually, maybe what we need to do is change how we elect our lower house. And these three things were part of the discussion in New Zealand for a while. Eventually, there were a number of things, I guess, that were sort of catalysts that, that um, triggered more intense discussion about what, what needed to be done. And to be fair, it came and went, and probably academics were more concerned about it than anyone else. But eventually what happened was there were um, back-to-back elections that became known as stolen elections, where the National Party received fewer votes overall in our first past the post system. But because the way the votes translated into seats, they actually won majority government with fewer votes overall. And that was an interesting trigger for people's discontent about the voting system. As they'd say in New Zealand, they, it just wasn't cricket that uh, a party could come second overall, but still actually govern with a majority of the seats. And that's an interesting thing because first past the post regularly, I guess, inflates a majority. Party typically would get, and in New Zealand, well, get less than 50% of the vote, but get over 50% of the seats under first past the post. And people didn't find that that necessarily was outrageous. In fact, that's, for some people at least, it was one of the real advantages of first past the post. But when we had two elections where the one party leapfrogged above the other with fewer votes overall, that seemed to trigger an unease among voters. And it started to really focus attention on the voting system. Uh, When Labour, the fourth Labour government was elected in 1984, and it had been Labour, of course, who had been disadvantaged in those back-to-back stolen elections. Interestingly, they didn't push straight away for electoral reform, but Sir Geoffrey Palmer, who was Justice Minister, he was keen on having a discussion around the voting system. And what he did do was form a Royal Commission on the Electoral System. And, you know, it's very often Royal Commission reports are published, they're put on a a shelf and they collect dust. But this one was different. And in fact, you cannot overestimate the importance of this report. It was conducted in a very professional, thorough way. It established criteria for judging voting systems. And the commission went through very systematically and did an appraisal that was seen as being um, fair and impartial of the various voting systems. And the Royal Commission, based on the criteria of what a voting system should do, very clearly said that mixed member proportional or MMP, as it's known in New Zealand, was the best system or the preferred system based on the criteria. Now, reality is, you know, that that report may well have just stayed on the on the bookshelf. And in fact, Professor Leiphardt said that short of a a voter's revolt, it's probably exactly what would have happened. But politics intervened. And What we did have was a time of real heightened political discontent in New Zealand uh, because we had back-to-back governments, the Labour government from 84, and then uh, the national government uh, re-elected in 1990, both of which had actually went very far in terms of policies that completely completely altered, I guess, the, um, the expectations of what a government would do in New Zealand. So it was very much about a neoliberal approach to government and Rogernomics and similar economic policies that came under national in 1990, which became known as Ruth in Asia. The voters felt that they weren't properly signaled in the election. They weren't what people were expecting. And yet there was no way to stop the determined governments in between elections. And even more important, 
Labour did this initially, and then when Labour was defeated and National came in in 1990, and instead of reversing those policies actually went even further, people felt if changing a government can't change the policies, then maybe we need to start thinking about changing how we elect those governments. And that's when the voting system and the recommendation, the uh, Royal Commission, came back into play. And yet, I think you can talk about all you know all the things that happened that led to this, and it 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 um, it has quite an interesting flow to it. But the reality is, in the end, you might say that. Those policies, the really unpopular policies, and this feeling that the electoral system might be broken, those perhaps were the underlying reasons. But the opportunity to actually do something about it really probably came about because of an accident. And that was actually with the Prime Minister, David Lange, who who misread notes, apparently, in a leaders' debate during an election campaign and promised uh, a referendum on the voting system. Well, it, it turned out that wasn't actually Labour's policy. They didn't carry through with it. But then when National was was um, campaigning to defeat Labour in 1990, it too promised a referendum, even though they said they didn't want to change the voting system. So I think it's actually pretty fair to say that what we had in, in New Zealand was a really mix of, of anger, betrayal, back-to-back stolen elections and political miscalculations by both political parties. And in the end, we did get a referendum in 1992. It was an indicative referendum where people were asked whether they wanted to keep first past the post or switch to another system. And the second part of the referendum was that if they actually did want to switch to another voting system, what voting system would they choose? And in this referendum, which was a standalone referendum, there was a 55% turnout and around 85% of the people voted to get rid of first past the post. And MMP was selected in that referendum as the preferred option by over 70%. So those are really strong numbers, but on a low turnout. So this triggered a second binding referendum that was held in conjunction with the 93 election and much higher turnout, 85%. And in that follow-up binding referendum, 54% voted to change to MMP, 46 chose to keep first past the post. A simple majority was all that was needed. And so in 93, New Zealanders voted to change from first past the post to MMP. It is an extraordinary example of actually, this was much more of a grassroots movement. The political elite were largely dragged there kicking and screaming. But through a referendum, New Zealanders voted to do something quite extraordinary, and that was to fundamentally change their voting system. That's an amazing story, really amazing. Do you think that people, the people voting understood the impact of the system that they were voting for? So if you look at the debates and in the discussions, the public discourse around the time of electoral reform, I think there were really very great expectations placed on MMP. And the reasons and the the rationale for changing the voting system, I think, roughly fall into two main categories. The first one had to do with fairness of the electoral system. The first one, the first part of that uh, was very straightforward. MMP is a proportional system, which means that the number of votes a party gets roughly mirrors the number of seats it will get in the House. So the proportion of seats is very much tied to the total number of votes across the country. And that was a real change from first past the post. So in first past the post in New Zealand's history, you know, a, a party wouldn't get over 50% of the of the votes nationally, but would get over 50% of the seats. And so there was a real gap between percentage of votes and percentage of seats. I already talked about the two elections where the party that actually got more votes got fewer seats. And so 
in our system, where you cast your vote is at least as important of, as how many votes you get. So labor had too many votes or too many wasted votes, particularly in urban areas, and nationals' votes geographically were spread in a more optimal way around the country. So in a winner-take-all system like First Past the Post, they did quite well because of where their votes were cast. It also meant under First Past the Post that small parties had real problems getting into Parliament. And you can understand that because a small party, if its voting base is geographically spread around the country, it could be they could get a, you know, a decent percentage of votes, but no seats. And that happened on a regular basis, that minor parties in New Zealand were really, um, really got a much higher percentage overall of votes than they did seats on, in election after election after election. First past the post works differently, I guess, if, if you're a small party and your votes are concentrated. And we've seen that in Canada, for example, in Quebec. But in New Zealand, the minor parties were always disadvantaged under our first past the post systems. So a better translation of votes into seats and the idea of proportionality uh, was actually one of the one of the elements of fairness that was very much front and center in the debates around the voting system. Another part of the fairness was electing more representative House of Representatives. And that didn't just mean in terms of having the smaller parties there in in terms of their proper proportion of votes. It was also about electing more diverse parliaments. So, more women, more Māori and Pacific Island MPs into Parliament. This idea that Parliament should look a bit more like the population it was representing. But the interesting thing, a second part of the whole series de of debates around the voting system was something more than that. It was seen as also a backdoor way of reforming how Parliament operated. And so in the debates... There, there was talk about it was really important that Parliament could act as an effective check on government, that the government could not dominate Parliament in the same way that it had been in New Zealand. So decreasing executive domination, increasing the size of the House of Representatives was also a part of the whole MMP discussion. And it also, of course, not just decrease, but actually made it extremely difficult for one party to win a majority in parliament. There was also a, a, a second part of that was that people had grown a bit tired of the intense adversarial nature of the parliamentary system, the government versus opposition. And the hope was that MMP, because parties would have to work more collaboratively in coalition, that they would have a new MMP culture is what they talked about. Less conflictual, more consensus building. I would argue that, therefore, that there, it really was discussed that it was more than just a voting system. They were actually talking about fundamentally changing how Parliament operated. And I think of all those things that I've just talked about in terms of fairness of the voting system, we certainly have become far more proportional. And the translation of votes into seats is far more direct and far more, it, it very accurately mirrors the percentage of votes a party gets. The exception to that, I guess, is that we do have thresholds. We have two thresholds. In order to win list seats in parliament, you have to win 5% of the party vote or that 5% party vote threshold is waived if you win one electorate seat. So if a party wins 5% or above, then they get roughly the percentage of party votes that they've received. Similarly, if a party wins one electorate seat, but say gets only 3% of the party vote, then the 5% party threshold is waived and the party will receive seats in basically that mirror their percentage of the party vote. So in this case, it would be 3% of the party vote because they've won one electorate seat. But overall, proportionality in New Zealand since MMP has been very high. 
we also have seen a far more diverse parliament in terms of women, in terms of Māori, in terms of Pacific Island and, you know, minority MPs. I think we've also seen Parliament has fundamentally changed in many ways. There have been huge ripple effects to the to the fact that we we now have MMP. Although we still are a Westminster parliamentary system, it is still you know quite adversarial, and even though you know there are coalition governments, it still operates like a parliamentary system. So for some people, the change hasn't been broad enough in terms of fundamentally altering how Parliament operates. And I think it's pretty fair to say the one thing that has not come through is I I don't think we've seen a completely new culture. You know, it is still quite adversarial. But certainly, these were things that were discussed in the lead up to the referendums. And I think one of the other points to make is that New Zealand through this time had had established an independent um, source for information. And so the education program around the referendum was actually very good. And so there was an independent source of information that meant the level of material and the level of debate was higher because of that. And Therese, I read an article recently which suggested that whilst the formal institutions had changed, that for many people in New Zealand, both voters and politicians, really hadn't got their head around the fact that uh, MMP means that you are going to have coalition governments. You're not going to have uh, a clear winner who can implement their agenda. Uh, You know, what's your sort of view on on that understanding or, because it's been quite a while, hasn't it, that it's been in place? That's a really interesting question because we've just gone through an election in New Zealand where the party that won the most seats isn't actually in government. The parties that came second, third and fourth have formed a government. And so it it has caused some discussion. And there were some complaints as well that it took too long for this government to form. But let's go back and pick through that because I think it's a really interesting example. MMP is complicated. Um, it's, how will I say this? It's, if I was doing a sporting analogy, first past the post was, is sort of like checkers and um, MMP is a game of chess. So I actually think if you look at studies, people aren't critical so much of having multi-party governments. And in fact, the New Zealand election study, which is an, a longitudinal study, a, a big pool of people that they go to, they find that multi-party governments actually score quite well with people on the basis that they prefer multi-party government over single party government in terms of doing what the people want, in terms of keeping promises, and in terms of making tough decisions. The one area where people it's a bit more evenly split is actually around the question of stability. So even as recent as the 2014 um, New Zealand election study, people were quite um, favorable towards multi-party governments. I think the issue this time was that this is the first time under MMP that the party that won the most seats actually didn't get to form government. I actually think the the bigger issue in terms of the current government has to do not with the fact that it's a multi-party government, but I suppose the process for government formation. I heard from uh, a, an MP in Parliament, a current MP, saying yesterday that constitutionally it's perfectly acceptable for the party that won the most seats not to form government and that is acceptable under MMP. The reality is that is acceptable under any voting system in our Westminster parliamentary government. And it's happened before in New Zealand prior to MMP that the party that won the most seats didn't actually get to govern. Because a Westminster parliamentary system is based on the premise that you must have a working majority in order to form government. 
And if the largest party in the House can't form that government, then another grouping, if it can, then that other grouping has to govern because the governing group has to have a majority. The interesting thing in New Zealand since MMP is we've we've come up with some new ways of, I suppose, of, of what governments look like. If you look at more established PR systems, straight coalition governments are very common. So you, you have parties that are together in coalition, in cabinet, with collective responsibility applying across that group. In New Zealand currently, our government that's just been formed since the 2017 election is actually an interesting mix. The party that came second, Labour, is in coalition with the party that came third, New Zealand first. That is not a majority. It's a minority coalition. But they also have a confidence and supply arrangement with a third party, the Greens, who came fourth in terms of the number of seats in Parliament. So the Greens actually don't have ministers in Cabinet. They have ministers outside of Cabinet. And they have promised to give the coalition, minority coalition, their support on confidence and supply issues throughout this parliament. So that would include budgets, um, the speech from the throne. Plus, they've signed an agreement around particular policy areas where they agree to support each other. So that is a slightly more complicated form of government. There's no doubt about that. And some people wonder whether it's too complicated to really be clear whose policies it is, who to hold accountable. But the reality of MMP is that no one party is likely to win a majority, that multi-party governments are the norm. And in fact, the New Zealand election study data would indicate that people are okay with that. I guess this time, it was the first time under MMP that the party that had the most seats didn't get to form the government. But I have to say that things have settled down, that there have been no revolt in the, in the streets, and the, the parliament is sitting, and so far, it's, it's been quite stable. And in, in New Zealand, under MMP, we have actually had quite stable government. Governments tend to last the full term. Terms here are only three years. The feeling is, is that voters would take exception to more regular or, or more frequent elections than that. They, you know, there's real incentive for parties to find ways to make it work, because the reality is it's unlikely that the next election is going to produce anything other than a multi-party government as well. But I do think it's interesting. A major point there in the New Zealand election study is that people think multi-party governments are better in terms of making governments keep their promises. And I've some, seen research that certainly supports that. Yes, look, that's really fascinating. And I just wondered, you've mentioned so far, and I know you've also written about the impact of MMP on representation in New Zealand uh, in the parliament, particularly looking at the representation of women and Maori. What, what has been your findings? I think that the findings actually confirm probably what most people or you know, most research would have expected that overall proportional representation has produced a more diverse parliament. There's pretty strong evidence for that in New Zealand, and that much better than was the case under First Past the Post. What makes, I think, New Zealand really interesting is um, we have the opportunity to compare First Past the Post to MMP. So prior to the, you know, prior to 96, which was the first MMP election and then post 96. But it's also interesting because it's a mixed member system. So some of our MPs are elected through first past the post. Some come in from party lists, which brings in the proportional aspect. And so you also can compare in an election how well women, Māori, um, and, and minority groups do in the first past the post or the electorate side of our MMP system versus the party list system. And without a doubt, 
the vehicle into parliament for more diversity has come from the party lists. And that's more have come from the party list, even though there are more electorate MPs overall. So the party list is is a really important component to understanding why we have more diversity in Parliament. But as you unpick more and more, it, it's really interesting. And if you, for example, look at women separately to start with, more women have come in on the party list. But what you also see is that there's a real difference um, in terms of of the parties themselves. So, for example, more women tend to come be elected in Labour than in the National Party. And small parties are another really interesting component of this, particularly small parties of the left elect more women. So in a sense, a party's, you might say, ideology being on left or right side does seem to make a difference. But what it really comes down to is position on the party list is really important. So a lot depends on a party's internal selection process in terms of determining who will be on the party list and whether a party has rules that it'll be 50-50, for example, men and women. And it's even more than that. It's also about how many women you find in the top 10 positions on the list And then for the bigger parties, it's also how many women you find right through the top 10, the next 10, and the 10 after that, that it really does make a big difference in terms of how many women are elected. So small parties, and the Greens in this current parliament, 75% of their MPs are women. Um, So it gives you a really good example of that. And it's not just that um, MMP because of the party lists allows the Greens to bring in so many women. The fact of the matter is, small parties themselves tend to do better under MMP than they did under First Past the Post. So women had been quite prominent in these minor parties, but the minor parties weren't having great success at getting into Parliament. So for the smaller parties, it's it's a double it's a double reason. So they're actually there. Plus, they tend, in terms of the Greens, at least, it's an example of a party that really does um, have its selection rules so that take into account diversity with co-leaders, too, that are you know one male and one female. National and Labour, though, of course, are our biggest parties. And what's interesting with MMP is we are still a mixed member system. So yes, the overall res- result is proportional. But there are actually more electorate MPs than there are list MPs. So in the current parliament, 71 of our 120 MPs have been elected by first past the post, and they sit as electorate MPs. And the fact that we have that, we have that mixed system, really does impact the overall proportion of women. Because women have tended to do much better on the party list side, but the electorate side is the numerically the bigger side in terms of the number of MPs in Parliament. And so it being a mixed system really does have an impact. It might be too soon to really know this, but having women in Parliament in greater numbers through the introduction of MMP, is there any sense in which that is having an impact on the numbers of women being pre-selected for the electoral positions? Yeah, it's really interesting. The electorate, it does depend on the party. And with First Past the Post, it does always depend on getting access to winnable electorates. And so the electorate side, it depends on the rules that the party has. And so different parties do better in terms of women on the electorate side than others. You've talked so far about there being, you know, a number of ripple effects of the new electoral system. Uh, And some of them I know are wider than just simply the impacts directly within Parliament. How would you describe those impacts? I think the reality is there's not a single part of our political system that hasn't been impacted in some way by MMP. Electoral reform is not just about changing how you elect a parliament. 
it then ripples on to lots of different areas as well. So in terms of constitutional principles, in terms of our public service, certainly our governments operate and look quite different. Parliament has changed. Our political party system also, we we have more parties in Parliament than we had under First Past the Post, and that causes all sorts of changes. So it actually spreads out around the entire system. So Parliament, we have a, a very robust select committee system. We actually had it before MMP. This so you know this is just one example. But with the introduction of MMP, because then the, the composition of select committees is proportional to parties' positions within par- Parliament, it means that select committees have become even more robust because it's rare that one party would dominate in the select committees. So it's not just in Parliament itself, it's not just in the chamber, but that proportionality going out into the select committee systems system has made the select committees far more powerful, far more important than they had been under fit first past the post. The change, though, has come not so much in terms of the select committees themselves, but how they're the composition of the select committees. In terms of some of the basic principles of our Westminster parliamentary system, to give you another example, we used to be really strict in terms of, you know, Leipard used to call us more Westminster than Westminster. So those rules around collective responsibility, that cloak of collective responsibility was really strong when we had one party with a majority and where that one party, the cabinet, actually was often a majority of caucus. So collective responsibility, those parties having to stick so closely together was really strong. What we have now is we have really interesting arrangements in our governing system. And with each new government, we found, I guess, that the, the reins of collective responsibility have perhaps been slackened a bit more and more. And we saw it originally in a government where a smaller party negotiated the right to disagree. So in important issues that to the small party, they could break the bonds of collective responsibility and actively speak against something that the government was doing without retribution. And that now is written into every agreement, the, the right to disagree on certain things. It went even a step further with, with governments being formed where the party was would support the government, but from the outside. And we have this arrangement now, and and you see it currently in this government, where you have a hybrid system, I guess, where you have the major party and uh, another party in a firm coalition with collective responsibility. And then you have a party out to the side that some people say they have selective responsibility. So on certain things, they've agreed that they will not only support the government, but you know they won't speak out or criticize the government. But on other things, they can agree to disagree and actually actively speak out against what the government's doing. So that is a really big change to how our governments actually operate. You can imagine the change that that then reflects onto the public service who are advising ministers and advising governments. And so it's led to some real interesting reforms behind the scenes to adjust to the fact that there is more than one party in government. And the governments actually have varying degrees um, of parties have varying degrees of closeness to the government. So you have you can have even just one major party in government, and then other parties with separate arrangements. The arrangement could even be just to agree to abstain on confidence and supply. So there are, the style of government has really changed, and everything else has had to change with that to properly reflect that. We, do, we don't have a written entrenched constitution, but what we do have is a really great cabinet manual that very effectively sets out these sometimes fluid rules around 
you know, the role, the responsibilities of ministers. And it really has become a far more interesting system, I guess, in that way um, since MMP. The impact on the public service has to be fascinating. I've been, I've worked in the oh, public yes. service myself. All right. So the next question, New Zealand has had, as you mentioned, Maori seats for many years. How did this approach to Maori representation come about? And I had heard that these seats might be under threat. Is that the case? They came about in 1867 and they came about at a time when the franchise, and it was only men who could vote at that stage, you had to be a private property owner. And Māori at the time uh, were communal, held property in, in common. And so the, the separate seats were a way to make sure that Māori males were not disenfranchised. So the rules in the Māori electorates, and there were four of them, were different. And you didn't have to be a private property owner in order to vote. So in a sense, they were brought about for a reason to keep the um, franchise as broadly, as broad as it could be in terms of allowing or ensuring that Māori males, at least, would be entitled to vote. The flip side, though, it was also a way of containing Māori who would have actually, at the time, in terms of their population, been entitled to more than four seats. And those four seats were actually locked in for a long time. So while the rest of the, the electorate, in terms of the general role, the number of electorates would change based on um, a changing population, those four Māori electorates were actually held contained at four. In, in some ways, they, they were brought about for the best of reasons and in some other ways, there are some real questions about, initially at least, how those those Māori seats, in a sense, kept Māori contained in four seats when they should have population-wise been entitled to more. Interestingly, too, they became very, very much labor seats. And so on top of that, they were seen as very safe labor seats. So because of that, there was a question of whether though they were actually marginalizing Māori voters. Interesting, one of the big things about the reform to MMP, it also included the ability to for the number of, of Māori seats to grow, depending on, on the number of Māori voters who enrolled on the Māori role in, rather than the general role. And so the number of Māori seats has actually gone up under MMP. But it's interesting, the Royal Commission actually initially recommended that the Māori seats wouldn't be needed under MMP, because the argument was that Māori party parties could be formed and would actually um, have a good ch chance of being elected into Parliament because of it being a proportional system. And in fact, the Royal Commission actually talked about lowering the threshold or doing away with the threshold for Māori parties to make sure that that Māori had proper representation in Parliament through separate parties. Māori voters were not happy with that recommendation, though. I think you can criticise the Māori seats in terms of they, they weren't as numerous as they should have perhaps should have been through those years, but it did guarantee that Māori had representation in Parliament from the time they were formed in 1867. And th th those seats were important to Māori, and Māori were really really against doing away with those Māori seats. So the recommendation was changed. Um, it became part of the, the referendum and the, the, the package around MMP was that the Māori electorates would be kept, but would, for the first time, as I said, actually grow depending on the number of Māori voters that registered for them. The reality is, though, What's happened under MMP is Māori have become far better represented in Parliament. In fact, it's up uh, over 20% of Māori MPs self-identify as Māori. And so they've tended to come predominantly through the party list. And so there have been some questions raised about whether the separate Māori electorates are still needed. And certainly in 2005, the then leader of the National Party, Don Brash, campaigned pretty strongly that the Māori seats should disappear. As you can imagine, it's, it's quite a, it's a, an issue that is extremely important to Māori. And the big question is whether it's, it's a decision that should be made by Māori.
And John Key, who replaced Don Brash, certainly softened the position on the Māori seats. So whether they um, are abolished or not, you hear rumbles every once in a while, but I don't see it as being on the horizon at this stage. Before I close this episode, I'd like to let you know that I'm hoping to get all episodes of the podcast transcribed and place the transcriptions on the website to support accessibility and to allow people to use the information from these interviews in various ways. To help fund the cost of transcription, I've set up a Patreon account for the Real Democracy Now! podcast. If you'd like to support the transcription of podcast episodes, you can sign up to either make a monthly contribution or you can make a one-off contribution. There'll be details in the show notes. In the next episode of Season 3, I'll be talking with Professor Benjamin Riley about electoral systems in Southeast Asia. I hope you'll join me then. Thanks for listening to Real Democracy Now! You can find more about today's topic in the show notes at www.realdemocracynow.com.au. If you enjoyed this program, please subscribe to this podcast, write a review, share the podcast with your friends and join the conversation on the webpage or on Facebook or Twitter. I'd love to know what you think is the essence of a real democracy. (laughs) 